Come on. There we go. Okay, so about a week ago I was playing with some sulfur hexafluoride and I didn't use it all, so I put it in a balloon to save it. And it's bigger now. <laughs> like, this balloon used to be about that big, and now it's this big. <laughs> and like, it doesn't feel as heavy, you know. Like, the gas inside has been diluted with air. I didn't know this was a thing. <laughs> but like, it seems like we've got some osmotic action happening and... I didn't know that could happen with gases. I'm gonna have to do some tests on this to confirm. Alright, so here's the setup. I've got four balloons filled with different gases in order of increasing molecular weight. So of course helium over here is so light that the balloon floats. Air is just sitting there. We've got some pure oxygen and a balloon of sulfur hexafluoride. And we're just going to watch these with the time-lapse camera and see what happens. Alright, so here's the time-lapse and as you can see the sulfur hexafluoride balloon is indeed expanding. But I think what is really telling is the fact that the oxygen balloon is shrinking almost as fast as the helium balloon. Whereas the balloon with the air is hardly shrinking at all. Alright, so the hypothesis is since there's 100% oxygen inside the balloon and 20% oxygen outside of it, there's a gradient so that the oxygen will want to diffuse out into where there's less oxygen. Another way to put this is there's a fifth of an atmosphere of oxygen outside and one atmosphere of oxygen inside, so that's a pressure differential of like 10 psi. So the oxygen is going to leave the balloon. But what if there was 100% oxygen outside the balloon as well? Well, then the balloon should noticeably not shrink as rapidly. So I got me a jar here, as you can see. I'm going to suck out all the air. I have begun doing. You can probably see how this apparatus is set up. I got a splitter here hooked up to my torch so I can put in pure oxygen, cap that off, and then I can inflate the balloon using the torch, letting off the pressure as I do it so the pressure will be equalized to one atmosphere, which is about 12 pounds per square inch here. This will probably take a while because of the small tubings. And then, of course, I'll have a balloon filled with oxygen sealed in the same way as that one. Just so we can compare. I need something heavy to put on top of this to keep it sealed. Right now, the atmosphere is keeping it shut, but once I get rid of the atmosphere by equalizing the pressure of oxygen, I need some weight. Alright, this ought to work. It's quite heavy. Let's uh, pull this down so we can watch things. Now that I've hidden the tubing. Let's turn that off. Turn it to the oxygen. And we're going to give it the gas. That balloon should shrink. Yep. Okay. The lid's now loose, because we've equalized pressure. I'm going to switch this over to being on that. Okay, now to inflate the balloon just a little bit. Okay, that looks 
looks about the right size. I'll just seal this with some electrical tape. <laughs> Definitely, I will have more oxygen in the chamber than there is in the air normally. I moved it into my fume hood just so that I have a better light. There's the two balloons about the same size. One surrounded by oxygen, the other surrounded by air. Look at that. We're about 24 hours later and the balloon inside the jar has not shrank hardly at all. Having an oxygen atmosphere surrounding the balloon keeps the balloon inflated for longer. Just so that I'm doubly sure, let's remove this weight and let's just uh, let the air get into the jar. That way it's no longer pure oxygen. Let's replace the weight and see if it uh, suddenly starts shrinking faster. As it should. There, I'll switch back to the time lapse. There it is. It definitely shrank. I didn't leave it as long as this balloon, but it definitely did. And it, watching the time lapse, you could see it shrink fast and then slow down as the oxygen concentration increased out here. <laughs> exactly as I would predicted. So now let's see what happens if I fill a balloon most of the way full with the sulfur hexafluoride. Will it expand as it absorbs oxygen until it bursts? See, I'm using a smaller balloon here. These are only the 7 inches instead of the 14 inch balloons. That way I'm using less of the gas and don't have to bury as much charcoal to offset my greenhouse potential here. <laughs> so yeah, just got a time lapse camera on it. See how long it takes to burst. I filled it up at noon, so there you go. This time lapse makes me suspect that if you inflate a balloon slowly, it can get to a larger size before popping than if you inflate it quickly. If you see the balloon bouncing around a little bit towards the end, that's because some moths got into the lab. Also, the clock seems to be having some issues, so I'll leave the timestamp on the video. <laughs> it popped! <laughs> so, Clock. I don't know what's wrong with it. Yeah, it took a couple of days, but it did it. See, I put an argon balloon next to it. You see, argon has deflated. Sulfur so fluoride balloon expanded till it popped. So based on my observations, this is what I think is going on. So first of all, the balloon is made out of a rubber polymer. If you zoomed in on it on the atomic scale, it'd probably look a lot like this ball of twine here. You know, it's basically made of a bunch of little chains of molecules. Very similar to this. And the gas molecules would be about this size in comparison. This little popcorn kernel here. The gas molecules, you know, they're zipping around at, well, on average, the speed of sound. And so they're slamming into the balloon. You know, they impart momentum when they bounce off, so that produces a pressure whenever they hit. You know, a force over an area, that's pressure. But the balloon, of course, is, you know, it's made of this rubber polymer, so, you know, it's loaded with holes, really. And occasionally, when the gas molecules are bouncing around, they'll be able to find a spot where they'll go into the mess of polymer. They'll go into the balloon. Or out of the balloon. They're inside. Now, the sulfur hexafluoride is a much bigger molecule. It's about twice as big in terms of radius. And it's also much heavier. It's about five times heavier. So not only does it have less of a chance of fitting through a hole, but it's also moving slower for a given temperature. So, it's hitting less often 
it's going to have a less of a chance of finding a hole because it's just not moving around as fast. And even if it does kind of get in there, it's not going to bounce around as fast. And you know, just those things add up, so it's going to move through the balloon much, much more slowly. So, I lost my cotton kernel. There it is. <laughs> so, if you have air inside the balloon and air outside of the balloon, the gas molecules are going to go in as fast as they're coming out. Well, they're going to come out just a little bit faster because there's a little bit more pressure inside the balloon, a little bit more molecules per area, so you know, they're going to have more coming out than going in, but not a lot more, apparently. But if you have a heavy gas inside the balloon that can't get out nearly as quickly, and a lighter gas on the outside that can go through the balloon much more rapidly, and you know the gas molecules are pretty far apart. You know, just in an atmosphere, one atmosphere of pressure, they're probably about that far apart on average. So there's plenty of room between them. The gas molecules on the outside, as far as they're concerned, it's a vacuum. So they're going to go in until the equilibrium is reached, until they're coming out at the same rate. So therefore, more gas molecules are going to end up inside the balloon, and they're adding together with the impacts from the sulfur fluoride molecules, so the pressure inside the balloon is going to increase and the balloon is going to expand. I thought that since argon is a bigger, heavier atom than what is on average in the air, maybe the argon balloon would expand, just like the sulfur fluoride did, but it did not. So it tells me it's not heavy and big enough to make a difference. So it's been, gosh, over a year since I first put these balloons here, and you can see the sulfur fluoride balloon did eventually deflate. And something that's interesting is it's kind of got like a greasy, like, something's happened to the balloon, as you can see. The balloon that originally had oxygen did not do that, nor did the helium. The balloon with the air has kind of done it, though. So. I don't think it's that the sulfur of fluoride reacted with the balloon. I think it's that the... Oh, it's also sticky a little bit. But I think it's because the balloon was expanded and stretched so tight for so long that eventually the balloon started to break down. And it breaks down more rapidly when it's got more surface area exposed, right? And maybe the reactions are more effective when it's stretched tight. So eventually the balloon broke down and the gas was able to get out. So there you go. That's interesting. And the helium balloon, you see, it's still, you know, it's got a little bit of gas here. I don't think that's helium. I think that's actually air that managed to get inside as the helium was deflating. Same for the oxygen. That's probably just air inside there right now. Of course. It would be fairly easy to test, wouldn't it? Light it on a fire and watch how it burns. Okay, so we got a bit of paper and a balloon that I recently filled with pure oxygen. Light it on fire. See how the balloon reacts with the fire there. Okay, so I just cut it open. Here we go. See, it didn't accelerate the combustion. It's pretty much just like blowing air onto it. Because that's exactly what I was doing. <laughs> so there you go. If you have a balloon that's deflating, gas is leaving the balloon, the gas is also going in. Now that's cool. I didn't know that. Now I do. And so you. Hope you enjoyed. We'll see you next time. I guess I have to bring this up because somebody is probably going to accuse me of stealing video ideas. This happens a lot. But uh, another great channel that I highly recommend, Applied Science, has also done a video on this similar topic some time ago. And in response to that, I'll point out that 
I started working on this video long before that one came out. 